Okay, Keda, thanks for the introduction. Uh, as you see here, I want to talk today about some aspects of, uh, on the one hand, generating uh, semantic metadata, and on the one other hand, how to query these kind of metadata uh, from a more user-oriented point of view. What's the structure of my talk? I will start with some motivation why uh, these topics are important from our point of view. And then I will have two main technical topics today. One is how to extend uh, the well-known media wiki uh, environment with some uh, semantic aspects and what kind of added value you get from uh, adding these kind of semantic aspects. And the second part of my talk will address how to provide uh, natural language interfaces for querying knowledge bases and how to support the adaptation of these uh, query interfaces to different kind of domains because that is typically one bottleneck you have when you provide these uh, natural language interfaces. And then I will conclude with some outlook on future topics we are uh, investigating. Okay, let's start with the motivation. Well, when you think of the kind of applications uh, a lot of people are interested in, uh, integration uh, is always a very important issue. So you see all these uh, environments popping up to integrate uh, some component applications into more bigger applications. We have these uh, recent developments like Yahoo Pipes on the one hand or Google Mashup Editor on the other hand. But basically, it's some kind of manual task you have to do in order to bring up that kind of application. And what you see in the background are typically rather simply structured uh, data models that are the basis for bringing these kind of uh, applications together. What we uh, currently address is what we call uh, the notion of content integration, where we are interested to bring together content from various resources. And these resources come in various kinds of uh, data models. So you have semi-structured uh, sources. You might also have some uh, textual sources. You might also have uh, multimedia sources. And uh, what is, from our point of view, a very important aspect to really be able to do that uh, integration on a more content-oriented level is that you need some kind of semantic metadata to describe these various kind of sources and therefore have a better basis of how to define the relationship between these different kind of sources. So that is uh, the integration aspect that will be addressed by looking into that uh, semantic metadata area. And then a second aspect is uh, when you think of how to access uh, information sources, well, we are all familiar with these keyword-based search. And one could say, well, when you talk about what you could tell these, uh, uh, call these short tail queries in these very popular domains like music and that kind of stuff that works very well. But when you go to the other domains you, that you could call these long tail queries where you have specific domains, not these very big user communities, uh, there is some advantage of providing a little bit more of uh, semantics to describe these kind of domains and then being able to do some better kind of query answering in these uh, uh, domains. And that it will be uh, the second aspect I will address in my talk today. Just to give you an example what kind of application we are currently investigating in one of these uh, EU-funded projects we are involved in in Karlsruhe. Uh, one partner is the United Nations in Rome, and they have a big department that is addressing fishery and agriculture issues. And for example, they are developing some kind of uh, fishery assessment system in order to be able to answer queries about uh, why you see, for example, in that example, the stock of tuna is depleting, and that is, are the kind of issues they have to address by getting a lot of queries from all kind of countries that are supporting that United Nations organization in Rome. What you have there as a typical situation is that you have a lot of different kind of resources that are available. You have some documents about uh, fish species. You have databases that describe uh, the current situation in various oceans, for example, and what's going on in different kind of countries that live to some extent on, on fish industry. Then you have uh, organizational aspects being described. So we have really a very heterogeneous kind of uh, collection of resources. And in order to come up with applications, still one of the major bottlenecks, how to come up with all these uh, semantic descriptions. 
And therefore, one uh, challenge is how can you provide environments that are usable for a lot of people in order to provide some kind of semantic information without having first to study for five years all kinds of logics, doing a PhD in the semantic web area, and then being able to provide that kind of data. So how to provide a path that is accessible for a lot of people in the end. And then the second point is how could you come up with uh, user interfaces uh, based on natural language so that they are rather easy to use in the end. And then you have all these problems of how to handle these ambiguity issues when you post these uh, natural language queries. And also you have to handle the effort of how to move from one domain to the next one because if that effort is too high, uh, in the end it will not be feasible to use that kind of natural language uh, technology in the end. So therefore you have to think about how to reduce the effort of uh, making that adaptation step from one domain to the next one. And that is part of that uh, Oracle system that we have developed in Carlson. And I will indicate some of these aspects. OK, so let's come to the first part of my talk, how to use uh, these rather straightforward uh, wiki environments in order to uh, enhance them in a way that you can really provide uh, semantic metadata in these, uh, in these environments. OK, here you see my running example uh, that's related to Croatia and Europe. Uh, and the example is uh, that you talk about a specific island in Croatia called Braj. And then you see uh, these typical links you are familiar with uh, in Wikipedia. So Braj is related somehow to Croatia. It's somehow related to Adriatic Sea, for example. It's also somehow related to tourism because that island is uh, to some extent living on tourism, but also to some extent on fishing. Uh, and what you see have, uh, here is the typical structure. You have these individual pages and that are linked to each other. As a human reader, you can put in much more uh, semantic relationships when reading that page compared to what a machine is typically able to do. So when we think of these kind of links, well, we have Braj, and then we have all these kind of other entities like Croatia, tourism, fishing. And from reading that page, as a human reader, we are well aware, well, that we have something like a belongs to relationship between Praj on the one hand and Croatia on the other hand. Or that Praj, for example, is located in the Adriatic Sea. Or that we have uh, some uh, cities uh, located on that island. Or that Praj lives, for example, on tourism. And then the question is, could we bring in some more semantic stuff into the basic uh, media wiki system in order to be able to capture these kind of uh, semantics that are very easily uh, catched up by a human reader but are not really available on the machine level when you interpret these kind of links. And that is the basic idea then uh, of how we approach that kind of uh, scenario. Uh, we have, in essence, uh, two type of extensions. One is that we are able to type these links that relate Praj to uh, tourism, for example. And uh, second extension is that we also type these attributes that are around. So when you talk about the number of inhabit inhabitants of a city, uh, that you can really be precise what kind of meaning that attribute has in the end. So that is the standard uh, syntax you are using uh, in that media wiki environment to define these links here between Praj on the one hand and Croatia on the other hand. And we stick as far as possible to the available syntax in order to make as less modifications as uh, possible in order to come up with our uh, semantic extensions. And here you see the two type of extensions that are added in the end. Uh, so we precisely define the type of link between Praj on the one hand and Croatia on the other hand. So we know that there now we have defined a belongs to uh, relationship between Praj uh, and Croatia. But uh, the user is free what kind of name he wants to use for that relationship. So there is no predefined ontology that uh, to some extent preoccupies what you are allowed to do in the end. We are still free here to say belongs to, or you could also say is part of or is associated with. Uh, but uh, we keep here the freedom that in order to support that bottom-up definition of uh, semantic relationships, the user is free to uh, choose the name he really prefers. You have a question? Yeah, so how did you uh, decide to use belongs to in this case? Is it just because it is based page? Oh, I did not get your point. What was your question? 
Yeah. So, so this is due to the fact that is a, a No, that is not an is, that's exactly not an is a relationship here. Uh, you see uh, the text uh, in uh, the conventional Wikipedia environment would be Praj is a Croatian island. And what you have seen on the page uh, uh, before, here you see is that uh, for whatever reason a link was defined between Praj on the one hand and Croatia on the other hand. So, and now we can decide what kind of link do we want to define between Praj and Croatia. And here we decided uh, we call that link uh, belongs to. We could also have uh, chosen other kinds of links, but that is the decision of the user what kind of link he wants to introduce in order to relate these two elements. Uh, there are different kind of textual representation that might end up in the same kind of semantic link or that might end up in different kind of semantic links. So that's the decision of the user who is typing in their text and making that decision what kind of type. Yeah, the user is uh, inputting that kind of text in the usual way with this slightly modified syntax, but then you are free to say, well, I call that a belongs to link, okay? Well, my examples are you have uh, that specific page uh, describing Praj. Yeah, that defines the context you are in. And then you define the links uh, you think are relevant to describe that entity on a more precise level. Okay, and the second extension is that you are also able to precisely define the kind of uh, attributes that are used uh, to further characterize your entities. So here you have that attribute that describes uh, how many, how much uh, square kilometers are associated with that uh, specific island. When you think of that kind of stuff on, uh, in an RDF context, uh, then you see that in the end you generate uh, two triples out of these two uh, specifications. So one triple is that belongs to relationship between Praj and Croatia, and the other triple is that area attribute that relates Praj to that specific uh, number of square kilometers in the end. So that is the underlying uh, semantic representation that is used. Um, what we exploit in that context is a rather one easy, uh, straightforward one-to-one -one relationship between elements you find in uh, semantic media wiki on the one hand, that is what you see here on the right hand side. You have articles, you have attributes, you have links. And on the left hand side you see uh, to which modeling element in the OWL ontology language these uh, wiki elements are really mapped. So for example, an article uh, is mapped to an individual. So that would be that, that correspondence. Or when you think of that typed link, we have referred to that uh, example belongs to. That is then uh, mapped to an object property instance. Or when you think of that attribute value, that is mapped to a data type property. So we have a rather straightforward one-to-one uh, -one mapping uh, between these elements you find in the wiki environment to the formal representation that is based on some subset of that, uh, of that our language. And that is uh, not a surprise because the kind of extensions we have defined had been tailored in a way that we can really have that rather straightforward mapping to the, to the OWL environment. Okay, so what is now the benefit of adding uh, that kind of semantic description? Here you see at the top the straightforward uh, page as you find it uh, in Wikipedia today. And what comes on top now is uh, what we call the fact box at the lower part. So here you see all these specific facts that had been uh, provided by, by the user. So here, for example, you see the, that fact that Braj now has that belongs to relationship to Croatia, so that is one of these facts. Then the other could be that Praj lives on tourism and lives on, on fishing. So now you see here in uh, that uh, box at the lower part of the page, what are all the facts that have been specified by the user for describing what he thinks is interesting to know about Praj in, in that context. 
We also have some uh, additional features in the background so that you have all these conversions available from square meters to square miles or th that kind of stuff. What might be uh, more uh, important is that you can also do some kind of semantic browsing. So you always see here these icons that you can uh, click on. And that provides you with the ability to browse around in the content of your uh, wiki system based on the kind of uh, relationship you are interested in. So here we would say, well, we now well know that Praj lives on tourism. Are there other entities that also live on tourism? So that we know, uh, well, maybe there are other towns or other islands around. And when you would click on that icon, you would see something like that as the next page. So you see again uh, that Praj is one of these elements that live on tourism. But you see also other uh, cities like Rio or Dubai that are specified to live on tourism. So that provides you with a very flexible browsing environment based on these, uh, on these typed links. So that is one immediate. Uh, benefit you get by typing in these links that you can uh, then browse around in that uh, collection of facts in the end. A second important aspect is uh, that uh, by exploiting these uh, extensions, uh, we are also able to generate some of these summary tables in a consistent and very straightforward way. You are all aware that you find the summary pages that in the end are manually maintained. So what are the cities in California or what are the cities in Germany. So somebody has to input that. And when you change one of these uh, basic facts, uh, you really have to think about how to modify your uh, aggregation table. And that is something one really would like to get rid of because that is a manual task, a lot of effort, and consistency is always an issue. So what we provide uh, in order to get rid of that situation is what we call inline queries. So you can really uh, put in these queries uh, into your text that you enter on your, uh, on your wiki page. So they are uh, embedded into these uh, ask tags. And then you can specify uh, your query by uh, exploiting a very restricted query language. Here you see uh, that you can specify a conjunction of uh, atomic uh, conditions. So here we specify that we are interested in countries that should be located in Africa and have some range of population around. So we have that type of conjunctive query here available. And then you have, uh, in addition, uh, the opportunity to define, to define what kind of descriptive elements you want to have uh, in the answer set. So how do you describe the countries you are interested in? by their population or by their borders. So when you then uh, would uh, activate that kind of query, the system would automatically generate these kind of tables so that you see, well, Central African Republic has uh, around 4 million people there, and that are the other countries that have a border shared with them. And by having that table generated, you are always uh, sure that if one of the underlying facts has been modified, that table will reflect that modification. So you have consistency guaranteed, and you have trust to specify one set query and not to maintain uh, the table manually. So that's, again, a very uh, immediate benefit you get from that kind of approach. So from our point of view, uh, that is one way of really taking uh, an environment where a lot of people are familiar with, enhancing it uh, with small semantic ingredients, but having then an immediate payoff by getting these kind of uh, uh, additional benefits more or less for free in the end. And I think it's very important uh, that you really show that people get immediate benefit. So otherwise, they are not uh, motivated to first invest three months of specifying all that semantic stuff and then have the first uh, added value based on that. But when you specify these links on the first page you are entering, you immediately get uh, the benefit from that. And that is one experience we have made that that is a very good way of really uh, attracting people to really use these kind, kind of features in the end. Of course, there are still a lot of open issues, and some of those topics are current work that we are currently addressing. So one question is when you leave that freedom in that bottom-up process that you can choose the naming of the links uh, on an individual basis, uh, the question is, is there some support available to generate some kind of agreement so that a lot of people would use that belongs to uh, type of link instead of naming it in a, in a different way? 
And clearly, you can then exploit some techniques that are known from information extraction and ontology learning in the background to handle synonym problems and homonym problems and that kind of stuff. So that is one way of providing additional support for that, uh, for that process. Second aspect is what I've uh, shown here is the situation that you enter a new page and then you uh, use the semantic extensions to provide that semantic information. But there are already a lot of pages uh, around and nobody would like to do the manual process of enhancing these already available pages with that uh, semantic stuff. So uh, one idea is how could you improve uh, or how could you support a process that at least some of these links are generated in a semi-automatic way. And I will address uh, that aspect in a minute, what kind of approach we have available to generate some of these links uh, based on the available information. Uh, then third aspect is uh, user interface aspect, how you can make the user interface still more uh, comfortable. And one aspect is, for example, auto-completion aspects or also using some guy kind of templates that users just fill in in order to provide these, these kind of links. And then an ongoing discussion is uh, what kind of additional expressiveness one might add to what we have already available. So what you have currently seen is that we have these uh, binary links, so we can only relate uh, two entities uh, to each other, but sometimes it would be nice to have also uh, NRA links available in order to cope with other aspects. So that is one issue that is currently investigated. Also, it might be interesting to add some more uh, semantic description to these links so that you could say, well, one relationship is symmetric, uh, is a symmetric relationship, but we are currently investigating that very carefully because the experience is as soon as your semantic model becomes too complex, people are not comfortable anymore to handle it in the end. And therefore, we really think about what kind of additional elements we want to add to what we have currently available. So that is ongoing discussion, what might be a useful idea in that context. Okay, so let's address one of these aspects, how you could improve uh, the generation of these uh, semantic links. And one aspect is how could you exploit some uh, learning approaches in that context uh, in order to generate some of these uh, typed links uh, in the end. What is specific in that situation when you want to learn something from a Wikipedia environment is that you uh, have no redundant information in the end. Because you have one page describing one specific entity, and there you find all relevant information. That's completely different to going to the web where you find these millions of pages uh, relating to the same kind of fact. So you need some approach being able to handle that, uh, that specific situation. What we have uh, done as a solution is that on the one hand, we uh, rely on a pattern-based approach. You will see in a minute how that works in the end. Uh, so that is uh, one uh, design decision we have made. And the second decision is uh, in order to cope with that uh, hardly redundant environment, uh, we do that in an iterative way. So we start with some bootstrapping and then improve the kind of things that system is generating in an iterative way. And in that way, we are able to cope somehow with that kind of challenge in the end. Okay, so what is the basic idea? You see here a standard page uh, from Wikipedia about that nice fish uh, blue gel uh, in that context. What we uh, exploit in that context is uh, that we just want to learn new relationships uh, that are related to the entity that is described on the page. So blue gel is the anchor. And then we want to learn what kind of links uh, can we extract from that page that is describing blue gel, for example. And we can specify in our system in what kind of links are we currently uh, interested. So you here see, for example, the example that we are somehow related in the relationship uh, where that fish is really living in. So a relationship between the fish and the area where you find that fish. So that is. Uh, the kind of uh, specification you give for that learning process, what are the kind of relationships I'm, uh, I'm interested in. And then uh, what we exploit uh, in our iterative approach is that we uh, exploit a rather simple notion of context. And you see what we use as a context here is uh, some tokens in front of the link 
and some tokens uh, that are uh, coming behind the link. So for example, when we talk here about Quebec, we have some uh, tokens uh, behind Quebec and some tokens in front of Quebec. So that is the kind of very simple context notion that we are exploiting in that learning process. So how is that now done in the end in that bootstrapping uh, in iterative approach? You start with uh, some very few seed uh, elements. So you see here that one seed element would be Blue Chill and Quebec. And then you go to your Wikipedia pages in order to see what kind of uh, patterns you might find uh, on these Wikipedia pages. So you, so you find uh, these explicit link elements and then the context by some text part in front of it and some text part uh, behind it. So that is that simple notion of context. We are using that. And from these uh, contexts, we generate uh, some generalized patterns. That is done in a way as it is known from uh, inductive logic programming that you generalize the kind of descriptions in order to come up with some more uh, generic descriptions. Clearly you need some heuristics in order to guide that generalization process so that, that the patterns that are generated in the end are not becoming too generic. So we have some restrictions on the number of wildcards that are uh, allowed in these uh, patterns. And also we have some restrictions on the number of uh, examples that are still available to support that kind of uh, generic pattern. So that are a combination of some heuristics to uh, guide that uh, generalization process. Then you use these patterns and then you go again to your uh, wiki pages and then you find additional uh, instances that meet these uh, generalized patterns. And then you have uh, done the first iteration of your bootstrapping process and then you have uh, additional instances and then you can again go to the next uh, iteration and see what a slightly modified context uh, are then generated based on these uh, new instances you have found. So that is the kind of cyclic uh, approach we are using uh, there. We are also currently investigating to supplement that cycle based on Wikipedia by going with these generalized patterns also to the web to get some information from the web. Then to filter what you find from the web because then you get uh, a lot of information. So there is some ranking involved. And by that you can feed in some additional instances into that iterative process. And the results are rather promising when you combine these two kinds of, uh, of learning scenarios in the end. So um, the challenges we are addressing here is that you have really these uh, situation that a lot uh, that you do not have a lot of instances available and therefore uh, we use that pattern based approach uh, in that iterative way. Also one advantage of that approach is that you get rid of a lot of uh, that uh, natural language processing. So we do not have to analyze the complete page about that feature in that example because we do not analyze all these sentences. We just analyze uh, that part of the sentence that is in front of the link and that comes behind the link. So that reduces the effort of that you have to invest into that natural language analysis considerably. So that is also one advantage of using that, that pattern-based um, approach. Uh, by filtering these patterns and ranking them, we can to some extent uh, guide uh, the precision recall ratio. So when we come up with rather uh, generalized patterns, then of course we will have a rather high recall but low precision. So by putting in some filtering function that ranks these uh, gen uh, generated patterns, we are able to uh, guide the system to some extent uh, with respect to these uh, notions of precision and recall. What we have also found in experiments is a very good indicator of the uh, quality of your pattern is uh, a very simple measure. You just look at the number of instances you find that support that pattern. And that is a good indicator uh, about the quality of that pattern. And what you can also exploit as additional uh, information is that you exploit some background knowledge so that you exploit, for example, some typing information of the elements that show up in the patterns. And that again improves your, uh, your result in the end. So that is one way of uh, generating some of these semantic links in a semi-automatic way in order to get rid, some of, uh, get rid of some of that uh, manual stuff. Okay, 
So that was the, the wiki environment stuff. Let me now move to the second part of my talk, uh, the natural language interface aspect. Well, uh, why is that uh, interesting? We think in uh, a lot of application domains, it might be really nice to have uh, uh, some more flexible way of querying the content uh, of the systems we have available. And one way of doing that is provide some kind of natural language interface for addressing that. Clearly, there are always these well-known issues uh, associated when you come up with uh, these natural language uh, interfaces. One is how to cope with all these ambiguity issues that pop up immediately. Also, the question is, how can you come up with uh, a large coverage of the kind of questions that you are able to understand in the end? so that the users are not too restricted in the kind of uh, way they are allowed to specify the natural language query. Uh, clearly, then you need some robustness because you never know what people are uh, typing in when they use these uh, natural language queries. And also, always the question is, how much effort do you need when you have uh, that infrastructure available to adapt that to a specific uh, application domain? And that is typically also one of the, of the bottlenecks uh, that are around. So uh, why is natural language interfaces maybe to some extent a more easy task compared to text understanding uh, when you compare the kind of challenges? Well, on the one hand, uh, typically these natural language uh, interfaces use rather short sentences. They do not have these very long sentences that you have to analyze when you analyze text in the end. Then we have here our assumption that we do not handle discourse phenomena that are typically very valid when you do text analysis. Clearly, when you think of a very nice interface, uh, that uh, discourse handling would be a nice feature, but that is currently not part of our system and makes life much more, much more easy in that context. So there are some assumptions you might put into that uh, interface uh, development that makes life a little bit more easy compared to uh, natural language processing. <laughs> so uh, the, just to show you what are kind of queries we are able to, to handle in the end. So that is uh, taken from some uh, geographic uh, domain and uh, test system. So you could ask related to some Europe uh, geography, which river flows through more cities than the Rhine so that you can compare different uh, uh, rivers uh, that are around. Uh, I will not go into the details. You just see that in the background, you have to generate uh, rather complicated logical expressions to really cope with the semantics of these kind of, uh, of queries in the end. What we have available uh, as a system is that system uh, named Oracle. And that comes uh, with two kind of uh, functionalities. One is the end user functionality. So you pose your, your query that is then interpreted as you have just seen it. Uh, then there are these uh, logical representations generated. And then you submit that logical representation of the query to your knowledge base. Also, the domain ontology exploited in order to come up with the answer, and then that answer is shown to the user. So that is the kind of end user cycle. What you also need is the development cycle. And there you see here the developer of the system, because you have to come up with all these uh, lexicons you need in the background to do all that kind of natural language processing in order to understand the meaning of the query, in order to be able to map that to that formal uh, logical representation in the background. But I will discuss later on one specific design ingredient of the Oracle system is that we have the lexicon split up in two parts. One is a domain independent lexicon that you have to just develop once. And then you have these domain specific extensions that have to be generated for each domain you want to, to address in the end. And I will come back to that issue uh, later on. Okay, so what is the kind of basic approach we use for building up the meanings of these uh, uh, natural language queries. So here the query is, which river flows through Karlsruhe? You see here that we use a compositional approach. So we analyze syntactic elements, like that verb phrase here, for example, or that extension of that verb phrase uh, relating to some prepositional uh, aspects. So by analyzing these uh, individual syntactic elements and composing them in a bottom-up way, uh, we, we come up then with the 
uh, complete uh, semantic representation of that query. So that is that compositional approach. Uh, that is one of the well-known approaches in computer linguistics to define the meaning of the sentences, and in our case, the meaning of these, uh, of these queries in the end. OK, um, what is the specific aspect we address when we uh, talk about adaptation of the system to specific domains? So what I have already mentioned is that we have that separation between the domain independent and the domain specific lexicon. The domain independent lexicon is tailored to the kind of words you find uh, in your queries uh, that have a constant meaning. So that these are the words that are more or less independent from the specific domain you are currently working in. So you can define that kind of lexicon once and then reuse it in uh, several kind of different domains in the end. What we also uh, exploit here in the, uh, in the background is uh, that you can refer to some uh, foundational uh, categories being defined by ontologies uh, in the background. And what we exploit here, for example, is that foundational ontology Dolce that is developed by Aldo and his group in Rome in order to come up with these uh, uh, basic definitions uh, of terms that are then independent of a specific application domain. Uh, what is then uh, to be done is when you move to a specific domain, like in our case into that geographic domain with rivers and cities and countries and borders, you have to come up with that domain specific part of the lexicon. And that is typically uh, the bottleneck to some extent because uh, you have to develop that for each uh, specific domain. And the question is how much training and how much know-how do you need in the end to be able to define that uh, lexicon? So do you need uh, a PhD in computer linguistics to do that? And then you have a bottleneck because not a lot of people are around there. Or are there other ways of generating that kind, uh, that kind of lexicon? And uh, what we have developed here is an approach that uh, people that do not really have that expertise in computer linguistics are still able to do that in the end. So that you have much more people available that are able to uh, support that, uh, that adaptation uh, step in the end. So how is that done in the end? So in essence, we rely on two basic ingredients to support that uh, development process. On the one hand, we have our ontology that defines the kind of relations we are interested in. So here, for example, we have that flows through relationship that relates river to cities. And that is part of these uh, relation uh, definitions we have uh, specified in our ontology. So that are the predefined links that are relevant for our domain. And then the second question is, how is that reflected on the linguistic level in the kind of uh, lexical elements you have to define uh, for your lexicon? So you find here uh, that notion of uh, predicate argument structures that are well defined for verbs uh, in that context. So you know that verb flow that comes with a subject and then it comes with a prepositional complement that defines through which uh, object uh, that, uh, that element is really, is really flowing. And then the question is, in order to generate the lexicon, how do you come up with that mapping between these uh, uh, relations you have defined in your knowledge base and how to relate them to these uh, subcategorization frames that are known from linguistics. And here you see the kind of simple mapping that is then provided. Here you see that relationship flows through between rivers and city. And here you see that subcategorization frame that is now uh, specified by the user to capture the meaning of that flow uh, verb coming with a subject, and then you see here the subject is the river, and then you have that uh, complement, that prepositional complement, and that is in that case uh, defined through object, and that is mapped to city. So you know that that complement is related to cities. Uh, by having that rather simple interface available, uh, our experience is that really users that just got some uh, basic knowledge about these uh, linguistic elements are really able to come up with these mappings and therefore uh, generate that, uh, that lexicon in the background. Clearly, you would assume that we, in case someone having five years of experience and a PhD in that area uh, will come up with better structures for your lexicon. Yes, to some extent, but the, the good message is that the quality of that lexicon that is generated by 
relying on these people that have just a very limited training in computer linguistics has still good quality. So it's comparable, not on the same level, but it's a quality that you can really exploit in the end. The second thing we are using in order to come up with uh, broad coverage uh, with our grammar is that we first specify some of these mappings and then uh, we ask users to post queries and for each query that fails because some uh, linguistic construct was not defined in the end, uh, we explore that iterative approach that then we define specifically tailored to that query that missing element for our lexicon. And in that way, we can iteratively uh, broaden the scope of coverage uh, we are uh, able to do. Because it's, it experience shows it's very difficult to imagine uh, from the very beginning what would be the kind of syntactic concepts people will use to pose these kind of queries. And by then seeing concrete examples, you get a very good uh, guideline what kind of uh, syntactic elements to uh, further enter into your lexicon. So that is an iterative approach guided by the kind of queries users are posing uh, to your system in the end. And that uh, shows that that is a very uh, good strategy to come up with a good coverage of the type of queries uh, users want to pose to your system in the end. Okay, so uh, what we have learned here is uh, that we can provide a translation of these natural language queries into that uh, logical uh, representation to really post them then as queries to, your, to the knowledge base in the end. That we are able to provide an adaptation mechanism that is uh, usable by non-experts. They need a little bit of training, but not these many years of training, so that more people are really able to support that adaptation uh, process. And when you then compare in some studies that we have done, uh, what are the results when you have chosen the experts compared to what are the results when you have chosen these non-experts, uh, you have rather comparable results uh, in the end. And by having that iterative approach, we are also able to uh, address that coverage problems in a, in a suitable way. So that is uh, rather promising from our point of view. Okay, uh, let's come to the conclusion. Um, but what we have addressed in both scenarios, both in that wiki uh, scenario and in that natural language scenario is how to come up with some kind of techniques that more people are able to provide the kind of content you need in the end to come up with your solutions. So that is uh, in the wiki environment clearly related to all these uh, web 2.0 uh, technologies, how to bring in communities to specify uh, content in the end. Uh, and that is related when you talk about these uh, interfaces, how to come up with all these lexicon uh, descriptions that you need in the, in the end. So from our point of view, that uh, semantic extension of MediaWiki is a really nice way of providing an environment where people are really able to come up with a lot of semantic descriptions. And by exporting these facts I have shown in that fact box uh, that are associated with these Wikipedia pages, you can feed them into all kind of RDF repositories and therefore generate a lot of uh, RDF based uh, facts uh, in the background. And also you have seen by providing that relation extraction technique, you are able to generate some of these facts uh, in a semi-automatic way. And with respect to these uh, natural language interfaces, clearly we need these semantic models in the background, but we have some ways of making that adaptation process more easy and also usable by, by non-expert users in the end. So what are uh, topics we are currently investigating in order to improve uh, the kind of solutions we have available currently? Clearly, we are uh, still investigating how to further improve that bridge between the semantic web world on the one hand and these community-based approaches from the web 2.0 world. Uh, and we see rather promising steps by combining, for example, these wiki environments as we have made now it available with these ontology engineering environments to come up with a very smooth transition from these very lightweight approaches to these more, more heavyweight approaches. We also think by adding some uh, semantic descriptions, we could also uh, provide better means of integrating that a huge amount of information that is around in all these social spaces, but that are still disconnected to some extent. And by providing some more semantics, we think there is a lot of opportunity to provide uh, better integration. 
Uh, what we always try to do is uh, to come up with solutions that are to some extent easy to use so that our people not uh, forced to have uh, several years of uh, logic training, computer linguistic training to really uh, do that kind of stuff and also to exploit some learning mechanisms in the background to get rid of some of the, of the manual uh, stuff uh, that we are doing currently. And clearly scalability is always an issue uh, both from a point of view how to come up with a lot of semantic facts in the end. So how can you really support that large scale uh, knowledge uh, acquisition? And on the other hand, clearly when you talk, for example, about natural language interfaces, uh, efficiency and scalability is always an issue because you have to have means uh, that you are really able to come up with efficient solutions in that context. So we have some solutions around, but clearly there is room for, for improvement uh, in all these uh, different kind of aspects. Okay. Thanks for your attention. Clearly what I have presented is based on work of a lot of people in my group. And if you are interested, just go to the, to the web pages uh, of uh, our groups in Karlsruhe and there you find all these uh, kind of uh, uh, relevant literature. But also it might be interesting for you, uh, go to the homepage of our AIFB Institute because there you see a completely semantic portal that has in the background all these uh, semantic models around so that you can export RDF facts about projects, people, whatever we are doing there. So that is one example of a uh, semantically uh, supported uh, portal and that you can pick a lot of facts uh, just by going to that portal. Okay, thanks again and I'm open for some kind of questions. Yes, please. Uh, I noticed in your, when you had a query over uh, for, for countries, you had a category country. I'm wondering if that category, uh, when you were querying, uh, okay, uh, you had a category in your query. I'm wondering if that category, sorry, I'm wondering if that category is uh, specific to, is, is special in the system or if it's just a tag that a user defines and also if if that's enough or if you needed a hierarchy or a, a list of labels or something for, for every element. Uh, you see uh, when you go into that geographic domain uh, we have an ontology in the background available that describes some uh, basic concepts of that uh, geographic domain so that you know some characteristics of countries what kind of relationships they might have we have seen that in that adaptation process that we have some predefined links. In my example, that was river to city. So we have the notion of river available. We have the notions of cities available. And we know what kind of characteristics they have available. So there is some uh, semantic model about your domain available in the background in order to support these kind of analysis in the end. Okay, so each element has like one domain that it applies to, like country has, or a country has a country, and then all those uh, relations are specific to that domain? Well, when you think of uh, ontology engineering, you typically rely on some reuse of already predefined ontologies. So you might find uh, some module about these geographic concepts that could be reused in a lot of different kind of applications in the end. So you do not have to start from scratch uh, every time you move to an, a new domain in the end. So that is the typical reuse you have as part of your ontology engineering process. Thanks. I found this fascinating because I'm new to, new to this. And, and for the domain specific uh, lexicon building the structure, how much is the volume work? It's like, <coughs> excuse me, so like we, we have like for geography, like I guess historical figure and every kind of structure, like is this kind of like, <coughs> like, uh, um, like something you plan to ask us, us to somewhere to do or, or like uh, it's like how much the volume of the work? And oh, the you see clearly what I've described here was one example system we have developed addressing that uh, geographic uh, scenario that has not a worldwide coverage. So that is currently more or less related to Germany and some geographic uh, elements that are related there. And then we did a specific case study to see when you take people that get just a very limited amount of training in that linguistic area 
and compare the results with what my experienced people in my team are, are delivering in the end. And then we compared uh, the results uh, based on these two kind of lexicons that had been generated. And that was the result uh, that was rather promising that the quality of the lexicon of, of these non-expert was really fine, not that good as my PhD students are doing that, but enough quality to really deploy the system. That is the kind of message. Uh, but we do not have available a system that would now cover all of Europe or all of US. That would still be an effort to do, okay. Danke. Yes, please. I had a question. Um, as you're looking at natural language queries and things like that nature, do, do we think as we provide more semantic information behind content that, um, that people will start building that intuition of different types, more long tail, more deeper queries, you, that they will build the intuition to build and actually write and then those queries, for example, like the borders, like, you know, right now I don't even, as a user, I don't even think of even asking that question because I know there's not an answer. Um, but as we add more, do you, do you see that if we add more semantic data that we can ask like a question like, how many, you know, how many countries have odd numbers of borders and also have rivers running from the north and south? I mean, like, yeah. these type of queries may yeah. not, you know, we don't think of them, but, you know, like, yeah. Uh, you see, uh, what I've said in the beginning, uh, you can distinguish uh, these short tail and long tail queries. So uh, we are currently a little bit biased to that short tail scenarios, where a lot of people are using that. We use these keywords, and we do that every day, uh, 24 hours. And so we are a little bit biased to these, to these kind of scenarios. But when you go to more specific domains, people are really interested in these more complex relationships, how things are really related to each other. And then you need that kind of uh, expressiveness at the user interface to really be able to address these kind of issues. From my point of view, that will pop up uh, gradually because people, they are well able to handle these short tail queries and the scenarios, but now they see, well, there are other domains where we have additional needs, and they are currently not well covered by these keyword-based uh, approaches. And therefore, I think uh, not within three or six months, but in a, a midterm process, I see that that kind of issues will pop up, and then you need these kind of solutions in the end. Yes, please. So it seems what you've described is a, is a shallow domain-specific lexicon. Are there core semantic lexicons that, for example, know that a river has water and lake has water that you build this on top of? Do those exist, or is that just something else that is outside the domain itself? Uh, you see we have that separation between that domain-specific and a domain-independent one. Yeah. And clearly one investment has to be put into first developing that domain independent lexicon. Right, for example, and what clearly, water source is at a city, it would know a, a river is a water source, a lake is a river, yeah. And clearly it depends on the application domain, so envision later on how mm. much effort you put first yeah. place into that domain independent lexicon, because that can be a huge effort or you can limit <laughs> that, okay? Yeah. And therefore you have to have some idea what would be in the second step, the application domains you want to address in order to see how much effort is worthwhile mm -hmm. to be put first place in the development of right. that uh, domain independent lexicon. And this is part of your cycle where they can view queries and say, hmm, people are starting to ask about water. Maybe we'll just link water to the other entities or things like that. Via oh, you that. see, currently we have separated that uh, process. So the domain specific part is part of that iteration. Uh, because we think that core part has to have some really good quality. So uh, the question is whether you are really willing to let other people modify that, you know? Yeah. So currently that is a rather controlled scenario where the experts are really looking into that kind of stuff. But clearly they can get feedback from these iterations. Then we see uh, that these kind of queries are not well handled. And they see that is not due to deficiencies in the domain specific lexicon, but in the kernel. And then they have to address that. Thank you. Hi. Um, I'm a little bit curious about, I mean, maybe I sort of missed something huge, but about of, of the relationship between the two portions of your talk on the uh, ontology construction sort of with your media wiki stuff on the one hand and the natural language stuff on the other. Have you considered or tried out being able to generate some of the, you know, uh, underlying metadata or underlying semantic structures and so forth uh, directly, like using machine learning or whatever, from the semantically enriched uh, wiki and or uh, Wikipedia, you know, 
vanilla Wikipedia, or because it seems like there's a lot of there's a lot of manual effort, you know, even facilitated, but that goes into the to the uh, uh, ontology construction, and then a lot more manual effort that goes into the natural language construction. I was wondering if you can, you know, leverage one for the other. Uh, we see that high potential of having synergy between these two areas. Mm. Currently, what I have shown that Oracle system is not really integrated with our uh, semantic media wiki stuff. Uh, why I put these two topics into one talk was uh, mm. that they both address uh, their challenge how to come up with environments that are supporting a lot of people in providing the kind of semantics you need in the end to come up with the solutions. And that wiki environment uh, would be one component in building up these background semantic information that you then might exploit, for example, in your natural language uh, environments in the end. And what you have seen in that pattern-based approach for relation learning is one concrete solution we have currently available to plug in some learning mechanisms already into that uh, wiki environment. Mm -hmm. But there is room for a lot of improvement. And there are a lot of techniques around in my group and all around the world uh, with that learning stuff. And uh, that is some uh, incremental process of plugging in more of these learning stuff. But clearly, that is very promising, OK? Yeah, I mean, yeah that's, that's what I'm yeah. interested in. Right? <laughs> A quick technical question. Um, are you allowed to, um, in, in your relation form on, on the, for annotating the wikis, you'd have a belongs to um, Croatia, for instance. Um, can you insert an entire binary relation in there? It, um, or, or does it always have to reference the, the, the page topic? Well, you see, uh, what we have currently focused on is that you start from your page, mm -hmm. and then you define the link between uh, the entity that is described on the page and the other things uh, that are then related to, to that kind of stuff. But the mechanism in the end is not biased to have that directed notion, you see. Mm -hmm. Because in the end, you generate these facts in the background, mm -hmm. and there you might uh, link other things uh, to each other, not only branch to uh, Croatia in the example. Mm -hmm. But uh, currently, the kind of environment, because you are on that specific page, uh, is somehow tailored to that situation. But the underlying techniques are rather generic. Uh, any, any more questions? So, uh, so I'd, I'd like to thank Professor uh, Rudy Studer once again. And uh, uh, if, you, uh, if you guys want to meet him, maybe after lunch or so on, please let me know. I'll, happy, I'll be happy to set it up. Thanks. OK, thank you.